Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. I am Bina Desai. I'm the head of programs at the Internal Monitoring Dis Displacement Monitoring Center, IDMC. And I just want to get a few housekeeping rules out of the way here, information before we start the dialogue. As you can see, the event is set up as a webinar. So you cannot see the other or the rest of the audience, but you can see the panelists and everyone is muted and the cameras are off. But this does not mean that you cannot participate on the contrary. Please enter your comments and questions to the panelists in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat box throughout the dialogue in the coming hour. We have one hour of conversation between the panelists led by our director, Alexandra Bilak. And after that, we'll have a question and answer session of around 20 minutes to half an hour, where we will be choosing questions from the chat box box and we'll have a, a continued conversation with the panelists. So thank you very much everyone for joining. Please don't, re don't forget when you uh, put down your questions to add your name and affiliation so that we know who we are talking to. And here with over to you, Alexandra, to start the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bina. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. And a warm welcome to all of you uh, who are joining today's webinar entitled Evidence versus Myth, Understanding Displacement in a Changing Climate. My name is Alexandra Bilak. I'm the director of IDMC, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center and the organizer for this event. Um, I, will be, I will be introducing and moderating our discussion today and I'm very pleased to be joined by a distinguished group of speakers who bring a very rich and diverse experience and a set of perspectives uh, to this conversation. Before I introduce them, I'd like to say a few words about the background for this discussion and for the topic itself. As you may know, the number of internally displaced people, IDPs worldwide, has reached an all-time high. Every year, millions of new displacements instances where people are forced to flee their homes because of conflicts and disasters occur across the globe. These millions, year in, year out, reveal the systemic and the intractable nature of displacement, but also the deep-rooted factors that are at the heart of it. Disasters and climate change are some of such factors. In 2019, disasters triggered the majority of all new displacements, almost 25 million or two thirds of the global total, most of which were linked to weather related hazards such as storms, floods and droughts. For the first time, IDMC's highly conservative estimate of 5.1 million IDPs at the end of the year shows that people don't always manage to return home and recover from a disaster quickly. And in fact, the protracted disaster displacement is a reality and, gro and a growing concern now across the globe. These numbers show that it's not just the hazards, but the vulnerability and the exposure of communities to these hazards that explain the loss of homes and livelihoods on such a large scale. Climate change increases the intensity and it affects the frequency and the seasonal patterns of the hazards that cause this displacement each year. It also puts additional pressure on already exposed and vulnerable local and national economies and ecosystems. Slow onset events can lead to food insecurity as they directly affect environmentally based livelihoods like agriculture, pastoralism or fisheries. When communities are unable to cope with acute food insecurity, displacement becomes a necessary survival strategy. Increasingly, the different factors driving slow onset environmental as well as social change become difficult to disentangle one from another. And they may culminate in humanitarian crisis as well as internal and cross-border movement. We also know that slow onset events, although they're not a direct catalyst for violent conflict, can exacerbate already fragile situations and act as a multiplier or magnifier of pre-existing conflict. The interaction of social, political, economic and environmental factors means that climate change must be understood as just one factor in a complex system that generates and that perpetuates displacement risk. In the past months, IDMC has become concerned by the narrative that surrounds climate change and displacement, 
a narrative that has been fueled by extrapolations and shortcuts drawn from studies and reports whose findings have been miscon misconstrued and amplified by sensationalist media articles. So just as the World Health Organization is fighting infodemics related to COVID-19, we feel the need to tackle misinformation about the nature, the scale and the impacts of global displacement. In the case of disaster and climate related <clears throat> displacement, there are a number of misconceptions which we believe can hamper the delivery of assistance and the protection of those affected. And in the long term, it will undermine effective policy making and poison the dialogue on the issue. There are three myths in particular that we wish to deconstruct. The first one is the dichotomy that is often established between disaster displacement and conflict displacement and the notion that disaster displacement is somehow apolitical, easier to resolve and mostly short lived. The assumption that most people can return can rebuild their home and can recover soon after a disaster has struck means that some displaced people may drop off the radar and they will then miss out on some critically important assistance that is needed, not just in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, but also very much over the longer term. Another myth, the second one, is that disasters are natural and that a certain amount of displacement is therefore inevitable and even acceptable meaning that efforts are still skewed towards preparedness and humanitarian assistance rather than structural and longer term disaster risk reduction and sustainable development. And then the third, of course, is that climate change will inevitably result in mass displacement with large scale movements of people across borders and significant new migration flows into Europe and other high income regions. As a result, policies tend to focus on deterrence to human mobility rather than investments in long-term resilience building and connecting humanitarian response more successfully with development efforts, risk reduction and peace building. Now we've been monitoring disaster displacement for 12 years and our evidence shows that disaster displacement is not necessarily short-lived, that it can be avoided and that most of it happens within countries' borders. So I'm very pleased to be joined today by four speakers who are going to help us unpack some of these myths and discuss how data, how evidence and accurate reporting can improve our collective understanding of this phenomenon and can help move towards more systematic education on this topic and ultimately towards more informed and effective policy making. I would now like to introduce these four speakers. Mr. Antonio Vitorino, who you probably all know, he's the Director General of the International Organization for Migration and a key partner of IDMCs. Thank you for being with us today, Mr. Vitorino. IOM has played a critical role in putting and keeping disaster displacement on the global agenda, not least, of course, through its inclusion in the Global Compact for Migration. Our second uh, speaker is François Gemen who's the director of the Hugo Observatory at the Univers University of Liège in Belgium. François lectures on environmental and migration policies uh, in various universities, including Sciences Po Paris, and is a lead author for the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And François is a vocal and visible advocate for a more nuanced and objective reporting on this topic. So welcome to you, François. Then we have Ms. Sonia Shah, Sonia is an investigative journalist and author of critically acclaimed and prize winning books. Her latest one, The Next Great Migration, was praised by Publishers Weekly as, and I quote, a masterful survey of migration countering some long held misconceptions. We're very happy to welcome her today for the first time. So welcome to you, Sonia, and thanks for being with us. And then last but not least, Professor Rajib Shah, Professor at the Graduate School of Media and Government, Governance sorry, at Keio University in Japan. He was the chair of the UN Science Technology Advisory Group for Disaster Risk Reduction and is a coordinating lead author for the IPCC. He has extensive experience in making science relevant to policy making at the national and international level. So welcome to you, Rajib. Very pleased to, to, to see you today. And I'd like to thank you all for joining from different parts of the world. Uh, I know that we've got uh, 
a group of speakers spanning uh, the US all the way to, to Japan. Um, so I hope that this will be worth your, your time. Um, I would like to start with you, Antonio, um, and ask you to share with us perhaps some, some reflections and some immediate reactions to my introductory remarks. Um, I'd like to understand uh, or to, to hear your reflections, uh, your reflection on the challenges as you, as you see it of basing migration and displacement related policy decisions on sound evidence. Do you feel that there is enough evidence out there to understand and educate people on how climate change is shaping migration and displacement patterns? And what specific roles is IOM playing to, to improve this? Over to you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I, if I understand correctly, you want us to challenge ill-informed and partial narratives about displacement and climate change. But I, I would start by uh, my remarks by challenging the very focus of our discussion. Not because displacement and climate change are not relevant. They are indeed among the most serious and urgent issues facing the international community. But because our ability to look at them from a comprehensive perspective will be essential to promoting sustainable well-being, security, and human development. Indeed, climate change is just, in my view, one of facets of global ecosystemic crisis that we are collectively facing, driven as much by global emissions and also by our unsustainable use of natural resources. Research and practice from IOM show us that uh, sea level rise goes end in end with land subsidence, desertification with deforestation, the increasing range of uh, pathogens with the erosion of biodiversity. All these processes have been ongoing for decades now and are already affecting communities requiring immediate and long-term responses. We will, however, not be able to understand, let alone address the different impacts of this environmental crisis, unless we account for all its components and causes, whether related to climate change or more broadly related to the environment. And we are, must also remember that this environmental crisis is a social crisis. It is poverty, inequality, and marginalization that determine people's vulnerability to present and future hazards. While climate change and ecosystem degradation translate in uh, increased occurrence and intensity, as you mentioned, of sudden and slow onset hazards, it is also our capacity to uh, address the social, the political, and the economic processes that can create risk that will determine the pathways our societies will follow over the coming decade. So my main message is we cannot just focus on climate change. We need indeed to have a broader perspective and integrate this debate in a larger perspective concerning the implications of uh, uh, climate change, environmental degradation, and uh, people uh, the, uh, mobility. Therefore, in order to respond appropriately to the implications of these changes, we need to avoid simplistic, simplistic assumptions. And in particular, we need to go beyond the rigid forced versus voluntary uh, migration dichotomy that in my view do not stand upon the reality that is much more complex than just that binary, binary approach. Addressing displacement, that was your question, requires understanding its complexity, even more when planning and preparing for future, and let's say, rather uncertain scenarios. Your own data, IDMC's data, estimates show that uh, natural hazards and disasters are already today a major driver of forced movements worldwide, three times as significant 
as conflict in 2019. Their displacement risk analysis show that the trend, this trend, will further increase in the future. So how can we understand mobility in light of this data? I think that uh, our understanding must be a little bit nuanced when we try to identify environmental drivers that are difficult to disentangle from economic, social, political, and cultural dynamics. Those are drivers that interact and the outcome is quite often displacement. That's what we try to do at IOM. With our displacement tracking metrics, we have uh, uh, positioned and deployed the tools of the TPM in numerous disaster settings, providing displacement and mobility data that try to support the delivery, the delivery of targeted humanitarian assistance, as well as driving recovery and transition. But to conclude, in my view, faced with uncertainty and the epistemological and operational challenges as we are in IOM, we must always remember that we already have frameworks, tools, objectives and commitments to address the different facets of this issue. And the secret is to have a syncretic approach to different dynamics and different re realities. Building resilience, reducing disaster and climate risks, preparing for and responding to displacement, above all, finding durable solutions for those that are displaced and accounting for population movements in urban and rural planning are, I believe, already identified as the priorities by key global agreements on sustainable development and also on humanitarian action. The challenge is how you can link humanitarian assistance with development strategic approach to guarantee sustainable solutions. And therefore, I think that the importance of the global compact for migration lies precisely there, promoting jointly all these issues together with a 360 degrees view as part of a comprehensive approach to all forms of mobility, whatever is the driver. And we trust that the recommendations of the UN Secretary General High Level Panel on Internal Displacement will also recognize the need to adopt these comprehensive approaches to look at the interaction between displacement and climate change. And for that, we are counting on your data as well as on our data and our very fruitful cooperation. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. And I, I think you've made some, some very important points and uh, this is all part of the, the deconstruction of the myth uh, and the, the, the avoiding, I think, that we, that we all want to see. We want to avoid shortcuts. We want to in, in avoid simplistic approaches and simplistic descriptions of this phenomenon. And as you say, we need to recognize, first and foremost, its complexity and its interconnectedness to, to so many other social, political, uh, economic, uh, environmental forces at play. Um, I also think that you've made a, a very important point when you say that there are already frameworks and tools out there that need to be also connected to have a more holistic uh, approach, a much more integrated and comprehensive way of addressing this, this challenge. And I think the focus there has to be on implementation of those frameworks. I will come back to that uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, just turning to, um, to Francois now. Um, as I said, you've been a strong advocate for, for fair reporting uh, on this issue. And I've I'm wondering, <laughs> yes, well, you, you do quite well. <laughs> and I'm wondering what you see right now as, uh, as the main obstacles. Uh, do you agree with, uh, with Antonio that there is, of course, a, a lack of understanding of the, of mm -hmm. the complexity of the issue itself? Um, so do you feel, though, that it's um, a, a question of 
lack of education on the on the topic? Is it a question of fear of the numbers? Um, or is there also a problem perhaps with some of the labels that we're using? Antonio mentioned, you know, th this, this dichotomy that we often see between forced and voluntary. Uh, you know, we, we talk about economic migrants, we talk about refugees, we talk about IDPs. Are, are those labels useful? And do you think that they also play a part in, uh, in these alarmist uh, scenarios? Over to you. Thank you, Alexandra, and, and thanks to IDMC for convening the, this important event. And, and indeed, everything you mentioned, education uh, labels, also every binary view of complex realities. I think that all of that is, is part of the problem and contributes to building a narrative that worries me at the moment. And, and increasingly, uh, I am concerned by the fact that the dominant narrative in the media, but also in public discourses or on social networks on, on Facebook or on Twitter, amongst others, uh, is the idea that climate change in the near future will displace millions or zillions of people who will come knocking on the door of Europe and other industrialized countries. And, and I think that this dominant narrative is highly problematic. And I've identified four problems and, and four myths that I would like to, to deconstruct with you. Uh, the first one, is that this narrative uh, of millions of people displaced by climate change coming to seek for asylum in Europe and in other industrialized countries, well, that's just not based on science. I mean, science tells us otherwise. It tells us that uh, most of those displacements, for example, are internal displacement taking place within the borders of the countries that are affected. And as a lead author of the IPCC, I'm always very really uncomfortable when I see climate activists making the claim that climate change will displace zillions of people who will become climate refugees because that claim is just not based on science. And most of the estimates that circulate uh, in the press or on social networks are not based on robust estimates or on robust models. So that would be, I think, the first Problem, the fact, oh, okay, sorry, we lost uh, you have, for a second. The, the, the second problem I have is that um, we, we see this, uh, this, these displacements as a future risk, as something that would materialize only in the future. Uh, and I think that is uh, a real problem because that makes us blind, completely blind, to the ongoing realities of migration and displacement related to climate change or other environmental degradations right now. And these realities have been documented by IDMC uh, for years and by other uh, research organizations. And yet we tend to see it as something that would only happen in the future, as something that would only materialize in the future. And, and the problem is that this makes us blind to the ongoing migration and displacement occurring right now. And we tend to be blind to those simply because they occur on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. And we are also blind to the many ongoing projects and initiatives that are there to assist and organize these migration and displacement. Uh, I'm always struck by how many uh, members of the public, but also, you know, members of the parliament or even ministers that come to, who come to me and say, look, what can we do about this? Uh, as if there were some kind of silver bullet that could fix the problem instantaneously. And I always tell those who ask me, what can we do about this? That perhaps the first thing to do would be to support the many projects, programs, initiatives that are ongoing right now. Some of those are being led by the International Organization for Migration, others by the UNI Commissioner for Refugees and other UN agencies, but also by the platform on disaster displacement. Uh, I'm always struck by the fact that in France, including uh, high profile policymakers, are not aware of the existence of the platform on disaster displacement, which is an organization that seeks to foster the protection of the rights of those displaced. And, and we tend to be looking constantly for the silver bullet and to be completely forgetful uh, about the many programs and initiatives that are conducted on the field already. So that would be the second problem or the second myth uh, related uh, to the dominant narrative, the fact that we see it 
as a future risk, uh, and this makes us blind to the ongoing realities. The third problem, or the third myth, so to say, is that it sets migration related to climate change apart from global migration dynamics. As if you had, on the one hand, political refugees in one box, economic migrants in another box, and as if there were some kind of third category brought upon by climate change, those category of environmental migrants or climate refugees, call them however you want, but those would be part of a separate category that would have nothing to do with the political and the economic determinants of migration. I think this is highly problematic if we see environmental changes and the environmental drivers of migration as separate from the political and the economic factors of migration. Because what we see uh, on the field in the empirical studies that we conduct is that these migration drivers are deeply interlinked with each other and also that they highly influence each other. And in many cases, it is a very Western view to separate environmental issues from political and economic issues. I mean, I'm sure that uh, for you and me, Alexandra, the amount of money that we have on our bank account at the end of months does not depend on the weather. But for most people on the planet, there is a direct linkage between the environmental conditions and their economic resources. And I think that we need to recognize that and that what we would label as an environmental problem is also for most people an economic problem or a political issue. Uh, and I think that if we set migration and displacement related to climate change apart from other migration categories, then uh, we contribute to what I would call environmental determinism. That is the idea that migration would be influenced only by the impact of environmental change. And we know that uh, the nature and the, the magnitude of migration and displacement is not directly related to the nature of magnitude of environmental changes. And I think that what is extremely important right now is to understand at the individual or household level how the migration decision is being made. This is one of the key objectives of the Habitable Project, a research project that we're conducting with IDMC and 20 other partners around the world to try and understand how the different factors intermingle and how the migration decision eventually is being made on an individual level. Another problem related to setting migration related to climate change apart from other migration dynamics is that it sets migration as a problem to address. And yet, uh, we also know from research that migration can sometimes be part of an adaptation strategy, something that will help households develop other sources of income or sometimes alleviate the environmental pressure on some resources. And that therefore, migration related to environmental change and climate impacts in particular does not always need to be avoided. And sometimes we will need to organize and facilitate such migration because it is a powerful adaptation strategy. And finally, to conclude, the fourth problem or the fourth myth that I wanted to address is the fact that we need to recognize that this narrative of millions of people displaced in the future by climate change is deeply xenophobic and plays with fears amongst the population around migrants Asylum. This is not, I know, of course, that this is not the intention and that the goal of this message is to convince governments to act on climate change and to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But the reality is that in the current social and political context, where refugees, migrants and asylum seekers are already scapegoats of so many social and economic issues, there is a real risk that such a narrative will fuel existing prejudices against migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. And we need to be extremely cautious about this because the likely reaction of many governments, if you float the threat of a new migration crisis, of a looming migration crisis, then there is a real risk that the reaction of many governments 
will not be to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, but will be rather to implement even more restrictive migration policies and to reinforce border control and surveillance. And for many governments, their way to adapt to this impact of climate change will not be to reduce their emissions, but will be to reinforce border controls and implement even more restrictive migration policies. Mm -hmm. I know, of course, that this is a message that means well, and that this is not the objective of those promoting the message about the millions of people displaced by climate change in the future, but there is a real risk to consider, and you know the motto, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I don't doubt the good intentions of those who promote that message, but ultimately it leads to hell for refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, and for our societies as a whole, which is the reason why I think we should be extremely worried and cautious about that type of message and recognize how xenophobic it can be. Hmm. So these are the four myths that I wanted to highlight in my presentation. I, I hope that that has met your expectations. Thanks, Francois. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you've made a lot of um, a, a lot of crucial points here, and uh, and there is already a connection with with uh, what Antonio was saying regarding the the lack of um, exploration, or perhaps of, of of use right now, implementation of existing frameworks. You mentioned the PDD and the lack of of knowledge, even or awareness of of these mechanisms that could already. Uh, uh, serve to to uh, to advance some of the solutions that we need to see. But I'd like to, before we come to the, the this kind of solutions side, I'd like to focus a little bit more on better understanding what can be done to counter those those misconceptions. We have talked about, of course, the the establishment. We need to establish much more clearly the in interconnection uh, between different, uh, you know, environmental, political, social factors. We need to understand where that 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 fear is coming from uh, as well. Um, so Sonia, I, I would just like to turn to you now because your your, your book is a very um, I mean your books actually uh, because the, it, it, there isn't just one your your books talk about all of these uh, these things because they're all very much interconnected um, and in your in your latest book the it, it, it explains how the news media present migration patterns as unprecedented and provoke fears of the the spread of, of disease and conflict and waves of anxiety across the Western world. Um, I would like to also refer to your previous book, which is uh, called Pandemic, which looks at the interconnection between climate change and, and pandemics. And I'm just wondering if you've, if, if you've had some thoughts about the interconnection then between climate change, pandemic and displacement and whether those connections, so not just to the link to economic factors that Francois was just talking about, but also to health uh, factors, does all of that sort of contribute to the to the to the confusion to the to the sense of alarm that people are feeling or do you think that that is what actually uh, explains the um, the alarmist um, reporting that we're seeing in the media and how do you think um, how do you think we could counter that <clears throat> oh well thank you um, for the question and for inviting me today um, yeah, I mean, I think we're in this moment of maximum dread about anything moving, whether it's um, animals, peoples, or microbes right now. So that certainly contributes to the alarmism around uh, this idea that people are going to be moving around because of rising sea levels or desertification or whatever it is. Um, but I think there's a deeper issue to just to follow up on what Francois said about this uh, sort of reflexive conflation of migration with crisis. And I think, um, you know, that really goes back to, and we see this all the time, right? So in journalism, we're supposed to write about like what's new and what's, you know, what's, what's the latest thing. And when we talk about migration, we really almost always look at it as a kind of calamity um, without even delving into whether it's life-saving for the people who are moving, whether it if there's absorptive capacity in the host societies they're going to, whether it might contribute to resilience of the societies they leave behind. And, you know, I'm, I'm gu as guilty of this as every other journalist. So when I first started writing about migration, I really wanted to look at whether there might be public health risks, for example, associated with certain migratory flows. And I was able to get grants and get assignments and, you know, pitch all these stories based on an idea that had, you know, that before even looking into it, before even looking into whether there might be, 
you know, whether this might this migratory flow might actually be totally fine if people actually accepted it. Um, so what I wanted to do in my latest book is to kind of <clears throat> look at the history of why do we reflexively conflate these two words, migration and crisis. And, and what I traced it back to is these ideas about nature and history that are really deeply rooted in the Western tradition in particular. Um, the way we think about... Oh, sorry. Are you getting a feedback right now? Yes, it was. it's fine. I, I think it's, it's fine. gone now. Sorry about oh, okay. that, Sonia. Yeah, no problem. Um, this idea that... Um, in, that things belong in certain places, whether it's wild species or human populations that each has sort of a singular place in the world, a location on the landscape where it belongs, where it should be, where it has evolved, where, you know, this, and this really goes back to hundreds of years of taxonomy and, you know, ideas that we have incorporated into a number of ways we look at, you know, biological inquiry. And we do, we see it in conventional wisdom where we use animals to stand in for places as if they're kind of one in the same. The camel stands in for the Middle East, the kangaroo stands in for Australia, as if these things have been associated from time immemorial. Um, and we describe peoples the same way in the way that we talk about people based on their ancestral origin, regardless of where their bodies happen to be in space. And I think this contributes to the way we look at history and our own history of migration, which is that we have systematically underestimated the scale and pace of migration in our own past, as well as in nature more generally. I mean, we're taught the out of Africa theory of migration, for example, which is this idea that our migratory past has been really episodic, you know, that we had this one big migration in our distant past when we walked out of Africa into this empty planet. And then once we populated the continents, we basically stayed still for millennia until this modern era of migration sort of was made possible by um, artificially lowering the geographic barriers to, to movement um, through rapid transit. I um, mean, I think that idea really contributes to this conventional sense that migration is this strange and disruptive phenomenon, right? That it is the deviation from the norm, which is to be sedentary. And then that, of course, affects how journalists write about it um, and how, you know, how the public views anti-migrant policies. Um, it means we demand explanations for movement, you know, that we, there needs to be one singular explanation because this is the disruptive thing that needs to be explained. And of course, the alarmist claims about tsunamis and floods of migrants, um, obviously these exaggerated claims about the scale of migrations to come with really very little context about the direction, the absorptive capacity and all those other questions that we'd want to answer if we actually wanted to consider whether a, you know these migrations would be sort of functional or helpful or beneficial or could, how they could be managed. Um, but I also see it in the framing of news stories more generally, even ones that aren't alarmist or exaggerated, you know, new, news stories that are supposed to tell us about something that is novel and unexpected, right? That's sort of the, the pressy for why, why you're writing a story is because it's something new, it's something unexpected. And so we see a lot of news stories that frame migration itself as the story, as the thing that is the news. Um, you saw just a few days ago, the New York Times ran a story um, called Two Hurricanes Devastated Central America, Will the Ruin Spur a Migration Wave? Question mark. And so the framing was that if environmental disruption triggers a migration, then that in itself is news because that is somehow strange and an unexpected result. But of course, what the science tells us is a totally different story. And that is that, you know, migration as a response to environmental disruption is, is an ancient and adaptive response to change. You know, in our own past, we now know through paleogenetics and archaeological studies, et cetera, that our migration out of Africa was not into an empty planet, but into continents where other human species already lived. It was not episodic. It was continuous. Um, ancient people didn't just walk out of Africa and stay still. They kept moving in ways that are just as complex and counterintuitive as the way we move today. Um, and we know this is true in nature, too. We knew that we know that 80% of wild species are moving into new places right now in sync with the changing climate. 
And this is being received by biologists, of course, as a mostly positive phenomenon, because it means that by moving, they, they might be able to survive in, as the climate changes. So migration is seen as critical to conserving future biodiversity. Um, and so conservation efforts around species on the move, unlike people's on the move, is really aimed at facilitating their movement by building corridors or even picking them up and moving them from one place to another. So I think that miss, the missing piece is that, that recognition of the role of migration in our own history and in nature. And if we accept what the science on migration is telling us, then it would become clear that there is no news in the fact that dynamic disruptive situations lead some people to move to new places. That should just be obvious. So, so the story then shouldn't be that, well, there's a hurricane and there's devastation. So some portion of these displaced people will obviously want to need to move. Um, that should be that should be obviously natural and life-saving response to this disruptive change. The story should be, why is there no system to help them? Why are societies that are best poised to welcome them not doing so? The story should really be the crisis of reception. The story should be the xenophobia, the absence of policies to manage the migration that we all know is coming and is expected and is adaptive. So even, and it's not to say that there's no disruption involved in migration and that can be part of the story too, but it has to be in this larger context where we accept that the benefits of migration have outweighed the risks over the long course of our history. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much for, for these uh, points. And I would encourage everybody to, to read Sonia's book. I think um, you've made some, some uh, a, a very strong case for a you know accepting the science but also accepting the history as you say none of this is new and none of this is necessarily negative in in any way and i'd just like to pick up on your last point here which is as you say a crisis of reception and of policy is really about the understanding by those uh, countries that feel threatened by these flows um that the I, th I think that the focus has to be and i'd like to turn now to to, to rajib to professor professor shah who um, I think in your, in your role as IPCC lead author must come across multiple challenges in, in communicating science and, and complex phenomena and complex histories of the of, of phenomena to policymakers and, and government officials. And I think it's worth um, uh, drilling down a little bit on what makes it so difficult for science to be tied more uh, clearly to, to policymaking. What in your experience um, what is your experience, I, I want to say, of governments listening to science when it comes to climate-related migration and, and displacement? And how can those who are generating the evidence, like IDMC, IOM, and, and all the others out there, work more closely with policymakers to ensure that that's, that connection is, is, is done more automatically? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you for inviting me in this very important discussion. Let me go a little bit in a different uh, direction, but addressing the two points which you mentioned. Uh, first, I strongly believe that science can and science is helping this complex issue of migration. There are two, I mean, the way I see it, there are two parts of it. One is when migration has already happening to monitor it, to try to find different types of solutions. But another, another option is also uh, to prevent migration, to analyze the root causes, try to see uh, different types of alternatives. And I think the science is equally important for both the cases. And sometimes we too much generalize science as one single word, but science has so many different varieties or so many different variations. There are so many different disciplines. So I will say that yes, the policymakers or the political leader, they're very willing to listen to the scientist. I will put the blame on our side that possibly we are not being able to con uh, convey the right message to the policymaker or the, the politicians. I give you an example. Uh, and this is my own example, my own experience. Uh, for last uh, more than five years, actually, we have been doing some, it's a larger research projects in Bangladesh. And this is supported by Japanese government. And it's a group of uh, Japanese professors and who are very sort of well-known from their own field, 
they are like the civil engineer, there are the flood modelers and so on. So it is most, mostly on the floods in Bangladesh. And in Bangladesh, uh, there is one of the major problem is the river bank erosion. So every year, there are lots of people who had to have this forced migration due to the river bank is eroded. And sometimes the river actually crosses maybe 200 meter or 300 meters sometimes in within maybe a couple of years or so. It's a major issue. So we went initially with the perception that we will make the hazard map for the river bank erosion. When we talk to the politicians, the local politicians, they told that we know the hazard very well. We don't need another hazard map. Can you give us a specific location from your own modeling from the flow direction or from the sediments of the river where if we migrate this group of people, they will be able to stay there at least next seven to 10 years. They are not looking for a permanent solution, but they are looking for a semi-permanent solution. And they were very, very precise on which type of information they need. But sometimes, as I mentioned, that we, the scientists have sometimes our own perception, what we want to put on the situation. So here, my own learning was the co-designing of this affordable solution, talking to the local community, community leader, the elected leader. I think that's one of the best way actually to enhance the decision-making at the local level and from the local level, gradually it's coming to the uh, upper hierarchy in the uh, governance system. Coming to your second point, which is like um, how this type of like your organization like you and how you can work more closely with the policy maker and also this evidence-based decision making. Uh, you know that in many countries, at least uh, so far what I have worked uh, mostly in the Asian countries, migration is not a national issue. It's more like the local issue. And when it becomes national issue in like, it, it actually like there are uh, cross-border migration and then it becomes maybe more national, regional, international and so on. And we have seen that also happening in different parts of Asia. But more, I think these are the local issue and these are very invisible. So I think one of the very important part of the science is that how we can make this invisible disaster more visible with proper evidence. Uh, just to give you another example that in 2011, in Japan, we had the major tsunami, uh, the Tohoku tsunami. And then after that, we had the uh, nuclear accident in Fukushima, and there was the largest number of IDPs, uh, which was after the post-World War II in Japan. Uh, it was not a climate disaster, but it was an uh, earthquake, tsunami, and the nuclear accident. So that became the big news, and everybody in globally, we know that. But on the same year, in 2011, in October, November, there was a series of typhoon which hit west and southern part of Japan. And in some cases, and there were quite a bit of strong landslides. So what happened that the people who are living on the slopes in some of the community, almost 30% of the community, they had to actually leave that whole community and migrate to some other places. But these were very, very minor thing and since I came to know because we were doing some project, we were doing some research, we were trying to do some documentation, but this often does not come in the news. So these, so my point again is that how we can with proper evidence, a proper documentation, making these invisible things more visible. And then another, another uh, interesting example from my again own experience when we were working in some of the South Asian, the coastal community, like there are, voluntary migrants, oh, sorry, uh, this is, uh, I'm talking about the non-migrant, like who did not want to migra mi migrate. Uh, there are voluntary non-migrant and involuntary non-migrant. Like they chose some who chose not to migrate and those who chose uh, not to migrate because they could not migrate. And we recently did a survey and this was very interesting result which we are getting that why they don't want to migrate is because the existing social safety net in the community and a very strong community tie which they have, like the social capital. Uh, so when we presented this to the local government and the local government got very interested in that. And then the idea came 
that can we actually link it to some local development, uh, uh, some sort of scheme to enhance this local safety net so that they don't need to actually migrate. So again, my, the key learning here is that how we can actually try to look at those root causes of migration. And if we can try to find some good example of social safety net, if we can actually link those safety net into the development framework in the local level, I think that makes a big difference and that process is very much required. So I'm not sure whether I could um, answer to your question, but I will stop here for the time being for the sake of time. Thank you. No, absolutely, uh, Rajib, and thank you very much. I, I, these, are, these are really excellent points to end this first round of, of comments on. And I'd like to perhaps come back to, to Sonia, Sonia as perhaps not so much as book author, but as, as journalist, just picking up on what Rajib was saying, the, 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 the importance of locally relevant and locally generated data for, for finding uh, solutions. And also I think for countering some of the, the, the myths that we're seeing out there, uh, Francois was talking about the fear of numbers, which of course is also driven by these these, these huge numbers that we're putting out there because they're global numbers. So of course they kind of, I, 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 we acknowledge that at IDMC that they actually probably fuel those, those fears. If we were to kind of really focus back down uh, to, the, to the local level, um, do, you, do you feel Sonia that this would be a way of um, managing uh, the way in which uh, media actually approaches, approaches the issue because we, we talked about the need to actually change the message. Somehow there needs to be a paradigm shift, a shift in the way people are talking about the issue and understanding it. And that message has to come from, uh, from a different type of data or a different type of evidence base. Do you think that that would be uh, sufficient to, to, to change some of the, the, the constraints that you felt as a, as a journalist in what would actually draw attention and what, I mean, what would get picked up in the media versus what would not? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think uh, local stories, and I think those do uh, those do get placed. I think you know there is a, a you know there is room for those in the media ecosystem we have right now. I think what's missing a lot of times is just the broader context, and I think we need to make that easier for for reporters to get. You know, the we're looking at a, one tiny one flow of migration. And we're sort of scrutinizing it in this, you know, micro with this microscope and pointing a lot of attention to it. And we're not looking at the broader context of like, well, how much migration has already come into this place that has been assimilated and it's been and it hasn't been a problem. How how does this one flow of migration fit into the broader flows of migration all around us? And I think given that, you know, it's it's very clear that most people have completely you know, erased all of that broader context, you know, because we're, we're, we're not taught it in schools. It's not, you know, it's not readily available to us. And we have a lot of anti-migrant, you know, policymakers who purposely submerge that history. Um, so that's what I think is the big missing piece, because I think if you put, put some of these flows into a broader context, into a fuller context, then some of them maybe aren't even stories anymore. You know, some of them are just, well, okay, this is a this is a migratory flow, but in the context of all the other migratory flows that have already happened that have worked, it's actually not a big story at all. You know, um, so I think the the nature of the stories we pick would change, you know, and and also the angle, you know, how you how you pitch those stories. You know, maybe the story isn't that oh my God, people are moving into this new place or oh my God, people are gonna wanna leave this old place. Maybe the story is, well, there's a lot of room in this one place and, and why aren't they absorbing more people? You know, maybe, maybe that should be the focus of the story. But I think to, to get to that, you still need to get, you know, we still need more of that broader context. And since migration is such, just such a huge complex topic with this deep history, it's it's still pretty it's still you know it's hard to hang on to it um we we want to make it into this uh you know narrow phenomenon that we can put a number on and say okay it goes from this direction to that direction and this is the total number every year it's this number but it's not it, it, we can't think of it that way right we can't really wrap our heads around the fullness of it so i think that we really need that paradigm shift that you were referring to before about 
how do we think about migration? Do we think of it as sort of this disruptive phenomenon that we can explain away simply, or is it really part of the human experience that's just too complex to reduce down into one number? Thank you. Thank you very much. If I can just um, circle back to, to Francois also on this point of um, messaging and what is really the story that we need to, to tell here? And do you have any just in, in a few the last few minutes that we have before I then uh, just finish with Antonio? Francois, do you have any uh, lessons that you can share about what you think are really the messages that, that do seem to, to click? One thing that occurs to me when I listen to you speak is that, of course, we're talking um, mostly about migration here, but and we're talking about external, of course, cross-border uh, movements. Some of the points that, that, that we've been making as IDMC is that, uh, that many of these movements are not chosen and, and, they're, and they're not across borders. They're actually happening within countries, uh, within countries, Orders. Does that actually make a difference, François, in your experience, uh, in, in the reception of the message? If we talk about, oh, you're outside. <laughs> if we talk about internal displacement as opposed to uh, cross-border movement, is this it, not a good yes, sign? I th yes. No, no, no. I, okay. I think, I think it, it makes a major difference. And indeed, my experience is that people are mostly concerned, not, by my, not with migration dynamics themselves, but there are concerns with the people coming to their home. So people are not really interested with migration dynamics and with understanding the flows of migration and displacement worldwide. They are mostly interested um, with the people coming and knocking on their door. And I think that if we were able to explain uh, the complexity and the globality of these migration dynamics. And that is not just migration from point A to point B, where point B would be the home of the people. I think it would make a, quite a major difference. And I think that we need to realize that when people are concerned with migration or afraid of migration, they are mostly concerned with people coming to their home, to their country. And it's not global migration dynamics that really interest them. And I think that this is an effort that we need uh, to basically tell them and also recognize that sometimes these big numbers don't tell anything to the people with regard to the situation they're in. And I think that we need to um, explain individual stories that really go beyond the big numbers. And I think that would make a big difference in the way we frame this uh, with, with the general public. Thank you very much, uh, Francois. Antonio, could I come back to, to you and to, to what you mentioned earlier? I, I, I think it's a a crucial point about recognizing the interconnection between so many structural uh, issues that the world is facing right now. Not this, this isn't just driven by environmental or climatic changes. It's political, it's social, it's economic. Um, and, and as you were saying, there are frameworks out there. There are policy uh, frameworks that have been adopted by a number of countries out there that, are, that, that, that provide this opportunity for a more integrated and comprehensive uh, response. Could you, could you perhaps just say in a few words what you see as really the, the key opportunities that the Global Compact for Migration offers uh, right now in, in shifting this paradigm, in, in finding better responses, and perhaps also in fighting some of these, these misconceptions? Well, in a nutshell, I think that the Global Compact identifies very clearly the link between migration and uh, climate change and the environmental degradation. And uh, being the Global Compact a platform of uh, uh, international cooperation, it can be used to exchange best practices and to put together the data and the analysis about the impacts of environmental degradation linked with other migratory deep-rooted factors. I, I, I will just give you two examples. One is, for instance, the, you know that in a number of developing countries, there is a trend towards urbanization. People move from rural areas to the cities. And um, in some cases, of course, there is a link with uh, climate change and environmental degradations in the places of origin. But in other cases, uh, people move because they want to have better job opportunities that they do not find in the rural areas. So there is a link, of course, with environmental change but at the end of the day, it's more complex than that. It's a question of finding an alternative livelihood in an urban environment. But if you look also, for instance, to the Sahel, you will see that an historical rural activity has been 
um, uh, transhumans, uh, the, the cattle that uh, moves around. We are confronted with the lack of uh, basic resources, like lack of water. And the lack of water affects equally the herbers and the farmers. And this is changing the pattern of pastoralism in all West Africa. But at the beginning, you have scarcity of access to natural resources. But the direct impact of that scarcity is that those people start moving their cattle through different routes than they used to uh, follow in the past. And when they opt for new routes, they enter into conflict with the farmers. And then we have a problem based on the communities and you need to be engaged with the communities. And here we are not talking about people intending to move their cattle to New York or to Paris or to Geneva. These are people who are displaced, who are on the move, but they are very much linked to a territory of origin. And therefore, the way of addressing the needs of these people uh, are very much community-based. It will require the mobilization of the local leaders, of the local authorities. Well, in those places where there are local authorities, which is not always the case, and it requires also an, uh, an in-depth work of community stabilization, of dialogue with the different groups at the community level to guarantee that the adaptation to climate change and to environmental degradation in terms of economic activity is done in a smooth way. So uh, we could not just see the big figures, we need to go to the small figures. And this is a very concrete case where definitely uh, there is a need to uh, disaggregate the figure to understand the dynamics in the field. Thank you so much, uh, Antonio. And thank you for, for, these, for this last example of the, of the Sahel, which I think uh, sums up many of the points that were made by, uh, by all the other speakers. Um, I would like to um, close this first part of the, of the discussion uh, and perhaps now open it up to, uh, to our audience. I'm going to hand over to, to Bina, who I think has been collecting some of the questions. I see there are a few questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, and I'll come back to you uh, after this next round. Over to you, Bina. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And as you will have seen in the chat, there are many questions that are coming in the chat box as well as in the Q&A section. So I apologize in advance if we won't be able to get to all of those. We'll pull out a few, but as my colleague Don put in the chat also, we're happy to follow up. And also that some of the panelists, of course, will be so as well. So there were a number of questions that really went uh, built on what was discussed here and the rich discussion we had, particularly around local solutions. Then another set of questions on the dichotomy that Alexandra started off with uh, that we see between our understanding of displacement in the context of disaster versus conflict. So maybe I'll start there. Um, because this, these are questions that came from our good partners, uh, the government of Mexico, um, who are also grappling with the issue of internal displacement in different contexts, and are really asking the question how we can transcend, in a sense, this conceptual dichotomy. And we also have the questions from some of our more eminent researchers at the ODI on this, who are working on displacement, in disasters, in conflict settings, becoming increasingly intertwined, people being really affected by disasters after having already been displaced. So this is a question very much that IDMC has been uh, grappling with, but I know, Francois, um, that you have also been looking into this at the Hugo Observatory quite a lot. So I would like to come back to you for a brief uh, intervention on that to just let us know you know how you see the increasing vulnerability in these types of settings um, as an opportunity for us to really bring those two concepts back together. If you're still with us, Francois, I don't see your camera on. Yes, of course. <laughs> Yeah, yes, Vina. Yes, indeed. This is something that um, we, we, we have uh, looked uh, into and, and this is also something that I think can be addressed differently for, for different audiences. And, and, and very often there is a, a problem in framing this in a very binary way or in a kind of black 
and wide way. Um, and I think that um, what is important to me when we talk about um, the influence of, of climate change on, on migration and displacement is also to recognize the political and economic nature of uh, climate change and so that we don't address, uh, I would say, things in discrete categories, but that we recognize in a way that climate change is also a form of persecution, of political persecution that we inflict upon the most vulnerable. And also that basically, also when it comes to voluntary or forced migration, it's not always black and white and any migration, even what we call voluntary migration, as an element of constraint, and even in the case of the most dire case of forced migration, there is also an element of agency that can be mobilized by the migrants. And similarly, when it comes to the distinction between internal and international uh, migration or displacement, I think we need to recognize that very often the latter is the continuation of the former, uh, meaning that those who are international migrants or interna internationally displaced usually were first internally displaced or were moving internally. And I think that we need to recognize the, the, the continuum between those rather than having discrete categories as if people were stuck in these categories. Thank you very much, Francois. And you also mentioned earlier uh, the need for us to build on existing approaches, um, really building on local experience, but also local solutions. So Rajib, if I can come to you with a set of questions that were around really are the, the lack of understanding of what is already happening at the community level. And you mentioned this earlier in your intervention. And the question in particular in the context of displacement where IDPs often themselves, those displaced are finding their own solutions and this is rarely documented. So is there, particularly in your experience of uh, the disaster context in Japan, for example, where you're based, um, is there a way that we can address this lack of our understanding of what is already happening at local level? Yes, thank you, Veena. I think, um, as I mentioned also in my previous comment, uh, I think the evidence to put the proper documentation uh, of this type of small, small uh, displacement issue or whether you call the migration issue. I think that's a very, very important part. And for that, I think the data, uh, the proper uh, data management plays a very, very important role. I'm not talking about the global database. I'm talking about more sub-regional level, more maybe the province, district, or the local government level database management. I think that's a very, very important thing. And most of the time we actually uh, don't have, even uh, like even I will say that in case of uh, Japan in some times, uh, uh, it's very difficult to actually trace this one because they are not going out of their town or city. Like if you are registered in that particular uh, uh, local administration, you are not going out of that particular local administration. You are just moving from the landslide prone area to a possibly much uh, safer area. But due to that particular movement, your different parts of livelihoods are affected in different ways. And I was talking to one of our uh, colleague in the, who was the local community leader. And he mentioned that with the 60 member household in a remote area, 20, 22 members actually moved out of that particular community. And one of the most affected thing in their particular community is their community festival, which they used to have. And that community festival is a very, very important for that particular community to have a get together. And they really put lots of importance. And this is again, a very, very invisible thing. No national disaster database actually pick up all those type of thing. And this is what we call uh, in other disaster term is the non-economic loss and damage. Like we are losing the whole community cohesion. We are losing the community value. Sometimes it is affecting the local culture, cultural context and so on. And that's why my argument was that making the invisible things more visible with proper evidence, proper stories, proper documentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajib. And that leads nicely into a next set of questions that we're trying to put to Sonia, if I may, um, which is really around how to make some of this documentation and some of the, the evidence that is being collected 
on a range of issues that come together in their complexity, as Francois was laying out quite nicely at the beginning, but even more so Mr. Vittorino, maybe at the start, I need to look at it in a holistic manner. How can we begin, become better at communicating this? There are a number of researchers here also in the audience who wonder how can the science um, and scientists who are generating the science and the evidence uh, help those that communicate and those that uh, have to also uh, report uh, on news um, in a way that would actually make it interesting without compromising on the substance. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I found uh, I rely on scientists all the time in my work. So I'm very thankful for all of the scholarship that's out there. And, um, you know, I couldn't I couldn't uh, be more grateful for all of the great these scholars who have who have done so much work on on these issues. Um, one thing I did find when I was putting my book together is uh, that I think is kind of missing in the public conversation about migration is more specifically about xenophobia. And there's this idea that you know xenophobia is sort of the sort of an automatic response that anywhere where two populations come together that there's going to be a xenophobic sort of backlash and the social science does not support that at all and there's a lot of examples where that isn't the case but I think that that's that to me that seemed like a big gap um, maybe it, it's in the research or maybe the research isn't coming bubbling up to the public conversation at, at enough um, of course, we're living in this moment where we have, you know, all these right wing populists in power. And so we have these xenophobic movements going on right now. But I think that broader context that <clears throat> xenophobia isn't something that is automatically going to happen when people move into new places um, is something that we really need to, you know, bring into our habits of mind. Uh, I think that would make a huge difference. And I think we could, there, I can imagine a lot more stories about that, a lot more research that's, you know, coming out about that. Um, because, you know, just when I've been talking about my migration book, it's almost always a question I get. It's like, well, how can, how can migration be adaptive if we always are you know always hate it when it actually happens you know when we always have a xenophobic response and you know the answer is that we mostly don't have those xenophobic responses um but i don't think that that there's enough sort of you know real data to hang on to i know there's there's some of it is out there but that to me would this is a big gap that could be filled more with more with more scholarship and and also more um more journalism around it too thank you very much sonia and you're talking about, or we have been talking about also a lot uh, about migration as adaptation. And at the same time, in some contexts, it is forced migration, so displacement as almost a failure of adaptation. And we have coming here in, in here a number of questions that are maybe I can put to um, IOM and Mr. Vitorino around, you know, the difference uh, between migration as something that is, uh, is, is a contributor also to development versus forced migration and displacement. And whether the in, in response to those situations, the humanitarian system, in a sense, the, the system of humanitarian assistance might need to, to adapt its business model. And this is, of course, where, where uh, in terms of the building the evidence for it, the DTM has been uh, contributing a lot, but at the same time, and at the same time, policy development has been advancing. We have a question here, particularly around um, how disaster displacement in context of conflict then would challenge humanitarian assistance. Well, definitely, humanitarian assistance needs to be reshaped to address the challenges of uh, internally displacement. If you see the two key uh, legal and the political instruments that have been adopted in 2018, the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Migration, you will see that there is a gray zone in between the two of them, which are precisely the internally displaced people. They are not effectively addressed, neither in one nor in the other. And that's why we are very much expecting that the outcome of the high-level panel on internally displaced people that the Secretary General has set up to clarify a number of key questions about internal displacement. And I agree that uh, when something starts as an internal displacement, it can evolve to become an external displacement in the sense of international uh, 
uh, migration. The example I've given you in the Sahel is one very good example because the Herbers uh, move around from one country to the other. They are constantly crossing borders. Uh, they could be considered international um, displaced people, but in fact, they are in their own place of origin. Having said that, uh, the challenge for the humanitarian organizations is that when there is a situation of fragility due to displacement, there is a first phase of humanitarian assistance. People are in need of humanitarian assistance. But what we see everywhere where DTM is uh, deployed is that people do not want to live forever on humanitarian assistance. Uh, people are in need of finding alternative solutions. And the, the, the possibility of returning back to the place of origin is sometimes unsinkable or unviable. So you need to focus on creating conditions for a new fresh start in the place where people have been displaced to. And that requires a very in-depth dialogue with the host communities, because host communities also react negatively when they find people arriving to their places. And uh, the action of the international community needs to be to show that the ones who are coming are entitled to build a new life in the place where they are moving to, but the host communities can also benefit from the arrivals of those who are displaced. And that's where the link between humanitarian assistance and development plays, plays a key a key role. Excellent. Thank you very much for for this response and and absolutely bringing together uh, the humanitarian and development uh, communities in the response. But at the same time, as you say, very much so focusing on the host communities jointly with those that are arriving or displaced as well as the communities of origin and and maybe i can come back um uh, uh, on another on another round of questions here because um we had a really good um question here on um the need potentially for so coming back to Francoise's point, but I will not put the question to you, Francois, not again, um, around the fact that the myth that displacement is really about something that is going to happen in the future and displacement risk uh, is not uh, as as pronounced today as, as we do see in fact, um, and therefore a distraction from understanding what is already happening. We have a number of questions here that agree with this take uh, on the matter, but at the same time say, well, in light of expected projections, climate change impacts, but also socio-economic socio um, and demographic changes, um, how do policy responses potentially need to change? And how do we need to understand then um, the development trajectory in the longer term? So even though we shouldn't be scaremongering, is there something that needs to radically shift in policy making? And from a science perspective, maybe Rajib, I can come back to you. You're working on the IPCC um, uh, um, assessment reports, uh, and you are direct. You were directly involved also in one of the the key risk uh, frameworks, in a sense, the Sendai framework. Is there something that is still where we're still too um, located, in a sense, in the now, here and now, and not understanding some of the sh shifts we will need to? we need to um, uh, make and, and go towards. Thank you, Bina. I think um, gradually we are possibly shifting towards more uh, the concept of what you call the adaptive governance. And uh, the adaptive governance becoming increasingly important in this uncertain world, uh, whether it is for the current pandemic, whether it is for the climate change issues, whether it is for the displacement issues or migration uh, related issue. So um, uh, how we actually bring this adaptive governance again, like it has been there for some time. We have seen this in the global assessment reports uh, mentioning about uh, this in a couple of the reports earlier, also for the UNDRR, uh, UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. But now I think it's time to make this adaptive governance more operationalized, like how we can actually operationalize at the more maybe, I will argue maybe with, with certain level of biasness is more at the 
local level because adaptive governance to operationalize at the national level in the policy it's quite challenging uh, but if you actually look at more on the local development frameworks or the local governance system it's possibly much easier to link with the local uh, governance mechanism, be it the climate change uh, adaptation plan, be, uh, be it the disaster risk reduction plan, or be it the local uh, socioeconomic development plan. So I think we most of the countries, whatever level it is, so there are at least certain level of plan which exist at the local level. So how we actually bring this adaptive governance concept in this local uh, level and operationalize it, I think that's very, very important. And very briefly before I finish, that in this current IPCC uh, sixth assessment report, uh, which and especially for our audience, um, this is now open, uh, this is now in the public domain already for comments and suggestions and questions. And uh, this whole uh, uh, disaster induced migration or climate change induced migration with a question mark uh, is quite extensively discussed actually in this whole assessment report. Uh, I am responsible for the Asia chapter and we have a very specific uh, um, box, uh, very specifically focusing on this uh, climate induced uh, migration and displacement in Asia. What we are getting still a, in IPCC term we call the medium uh, evidence, medium level of evidence and medium level of confidence. Evidence means still we don't have very good in-depth analysis so that we can make a very strong conclusion. And confidence means the number of research is still low in number. Uh, so I strongly encourage actually to all our audience because I understand that some in audience there are also many researchers. So if you are interested in this uh, migration related research or if you are already conducting the migration re related research, please look at the IPCC, the, this current second order draft and please make your contribution or comment so that your research are actually incorporated and strengthen this uh, migration issue in the uh, current IPCC assessment report. If I may jump in quickly here with, with a few words on, on how policies and how adaptation policies could be better um, framed. I think that what is extremely important in the future is that we account for the perceptions of environmental change by local populations. Very often we have adaptation policies that are geared towards the projected impacts of climate change. Uh, but knowing the projected impacts of climate change is one thing but how these impacts will be perceived by the local population is another thing. And very often their migration decision will be based not on the impacts themselves, but on how they perceive these impacts. So it's really important that adaptation policies account for these local perceptions as well. Thank you very much for adding this, Francois. And I know, of course, uh, your uh, institute, the Hugo Observatory, is leading a, a, a consor research consortium on this uh, precise With issue you. of understanding. <laughs> and we're also part of it and delighted to be so on the understanding of the social tipping points and changes in perception yep. and what that means. And it's, it's absolutely right that that needs to become part of, <sighs> of our understanding and, and of the projections going forward. Sonia, may I just come once more to you? I mean, uh, Rajib was just talking about these levels of confidence um, and the uh, ways in which these uh, our understanding is being framed. Then he was also talking about adaptive governance. These types of words and jargon. How again, as a journalist, how do you how do you convey that? Is it possible, or should we try to find really different ways of then talking about this? <clears throat> we definitely need to translate all of that you know so so when i was starting this work it was there was a long process and there always is <clears throat> of under trying to under excuse me <clears throat> trying to understand the lingo and bring it back down to ordinary language um and you know I, it's understandable i mean i think that's what communicators and journalists have to do so i don't think it's incumbent upon researchers and policymakers to tell it like a story that we can understand. Um, <clears throat> I think the main thing is making yourself available to us so that we can actually ask you those questions. Um, but I think part of it is, uh, you know, we need, we, need a, we need a few crumbs, you know, give, give us a little something so we know what you mean when you say adaptive governance. I mean, that is not something that is obvious to just a lay person at all. 
um, what what that actually conveys. And of course, it's a big concept that's complicated and everything. Um, but see, so we need a few little crumbs. <clears throat> but I don't, you know, simplifying it completely down, I don't think is really necessary. And actually, for me, it would take away some of the allure of writing about it. You know, if you if you give me something that's completely boiled down and here's the story and here's exactly how you write it. And this is, you know, this I've simplified it down in this press release. Then I'm not as a journalist, I'm less interested, actually, because I want to feel like I'm doing my work, too. Right. So my work is taking your complicated thing and and turning it into something that lay people can understand. Um, so I, I don't want to be fed at all, on, you know, completely on, you know, I don't want to be like fed, you know, force fed all of it. Um, so but just a few crumbs and then also making experts available. And I think most, you know, I've been so grateful for all of the scholars and experts who made were so generous with their time but there still is you know a barrier there you know I think a lot of um, a lot of scholars feel put out by all of our questions and that's completely understandable um, but we need that you know <laughs> as annoying as it is we we need that we need to have people that we can ask our dumb questions to as well as our smart questions you know when we're first starting out uh, writing about these things and we don't know all the lingo we don't know all the complicated history and all of that um, to have somebody who can actually you know answer some of those questions so that reporters don't have to read five books I mean I'm able to do that because I was writing a book but if I'm just writing a story I can't read four books and a 200 page report first um, before I pitch my story to my editor um, so, you know, so, so there's sort of a, a sweet spot in between the, you know, in between those two kind of polar poles. Thank you very much, Sonia. And I'll close maybe with a final word for Mr. Vitorino before we then hand back to, to Alexandra to, to wrap us up. Um, you know, you have this uh, group of scholars, communicators here, and us as your long-term partner at IDMC who are trying to also work on generating the evidence. What would you be your wish from us collectively to contribute now going forward to the points that you raised at the very beginning, how we can really make advances now? Well, I'm very much hopeful about the cooperation that we have with you in not just in collecting the data, but also in uh, uh, disaggregating the data so that we can provide the necessary evidence for the academics, for the researchers, and for the, the policy decision makers to take the most appropriate decisions. Probably the biggest challenge for us is to overcome a very much silo, a very much silo approach, uh, which is very common in different areas, not just in the humanitarian area, but also in the development area. Development stakeholders are very often suspicious about humanitarian stakeholders and vice versa. And you need to bring together these different capacities in the system between humanitarian assistance, uh, development support, and also peace and security, as we have experienced in a number of places. So having this joint effort is my best wish uh, for the continuation of, a, of our very fruitful cooperation. And we expect that the data that we provide will be used by the scholars and by the researchers uh, in a critical way to help us to improve our own methodologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, over to you, Alexandra. And just a final word, thank you very much for all the questions. We will get back to some of the individuals who've asked for follow-up. Thank you again. Thank you, Bina. And thank you to all of you who have um, asked these questions. Um, I think it's, it's really contributed to, to enriching the discussion. Um, I'm not going to try and summarize uh, the, the, the full discussion because I wouldn't do justice to it. Uh, maybe just to pick out the two or three key points that I think have, have come out and that I think at least on our side at IDMC will merit uh, further reflection. Um, the first point which many of you have, have raised and I think we all acknowledge is, is of course the global scale of this phenomenon, its global nature. And at the same time, uh, many of the misconceptions that are contained in that, in that, in that global picture linked to the dichotomy 
justified or not, between disaster displacement and, and conflict displacement, the need to look at human mobility, displacement, migration more of, of, as, a, as a continuum, but also to recognize that many of the impacts, regardless of the context in which displacement and migration or forced migration are taking place, the impacts are often very much the same on, on, on vulnerable communities. Um, and, I, and within that global picture, I think we've also acknowledged that it's never a single factor that is responsible for, uh, for creating the trends that we're seeing today. It's very much an interconnectedness between different um, environmental, political, social, economic uh, drivers, and they're all, they're all, they all come together and, and they're all uh, interconnected, and which is why uh, I completely agree with you, Antonio, we need to do away with the siloed um, approach. Um, Within that, I also think that uh, an interesting point was raised uh, by Sonia regarding the issue of xenophobia agreed. I think we need to look at the complexity of the issue, not just from the point of departure of where these communities are fleeing from and what are the factors at play in causing the displacement in the first place, but also the complexity in the reception areas they are arriving in communities that are themselves extremely complex, where all sorts of um, political, social, economic drivers are at play that could also be explaining many of the reactions that we're seeing, the xenophobic reactions uh, and the negative reactions. And I think unpacking that a little bit further and focusing on some research on that, on that area could also then help to, um, to adjust some of the, 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 the messaging and the policy making. Um, on the message on the policy making side, um, which is the second key point that has come out of this is really uh, a, I, I sense uh, that this message that has been given by, by all of you is, is really to focus much more on, on the local level and the community based level, not just in terms of data collection and, and generating the, the human stories that are needed to contextualize this issue to stop looking at it as this this global uh, large scale uh, phenomenon, which of course it is. But, but, to, but to disaggregate, as Antonio was saying, disaggregates the, the, the stories um, and, and, uh, and, and better understand how communities themselves are, are impacted so that we can then also have more informed dialogues with uh, sorry, local or even municipal level uh, authorities and decision makers to address, for example, the urban nature of displacement, to address some of the, the pastoralist um, displacement uh, examples in the Sahel that, uh, that Antonio gave as well, but also to start having a dialogue with host communities uh, for when it comes to reaching solutions. How can we more effectively allow for a return or even a local integration of displaced communities and migrants into host communities? And for that, there needs to be much more understanding of those uh, dynamics at that, um, at that level. Um, I think it was Sonia who also mentioned, you know, better understanding the local perceptions of, of, uh, of those different impacts. Um, there's, of course, linked to that, the issue of governance. I'm not sure I understand the full concept of adaptive government, so I'm just going to talk about governance in, in general and more broadly when I, what I mean by that is really just the implementation of, of policy because as, as we said at the beginning, there are policy frameworks out there, there are oftentimes in many uh, countries, particularly uh, I'm thinking sub-Saharan African countries that have ratified uh, frameworks such as the Kampala Convention that are, that are hugely forward-looking when it comes to addressing both conflict and disaster displacement, including displacement risk, but where the hurdle often comes really at the level, at the, at the time of implementation and where we start looking at issues of, of governance, of, uh, of financing, of technical resources, etc. And this is where I think we need to also spend a little bit more time uh, understanding and documenting uh, the solutions, the ways in which different countries have approached it from one context and one sub-national context to, to another so that others can, can learn from those positive experiences. And then the final uh, point, which was very much the, the starting point for this discussion, which is really on the, the messaging and the narrative around, around this issue. Rajib, you, you said something that as the director of IDMC, I, I, I really take to heart and, and, and I'd like to speak to you about perhaps in a bit more detail to really understand when you say the policymakers are actually willing to listen. That is great news. And you say, but we haven't been able to convey the message in the right way. And I think the responsibility then is, is very much on us as a community to find the best way not to not to 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 simplify the message, as Sonia was saying, let's not let's not uh, 
boil it down to, uh, to, to something that wouldn't really mean anything anymore. We need to retain that complexity, but how can we really push for a narrative that will resonate so much more in the ears of uh, those people on the reception side, but also in the, the broader kind of uh, international community's ears. Um, so again, as, as, a, as an organization that is devoted to uh, the generation of, of evidence, perhaps we also need to get better at, uh, at, at the communication side and the, and the outreach. Um, I would like to perhaps just end maybe on, um, well, I, I, I would like to to thank you, of course, very much for all your contributions and for having taken part in this uh, in this conversation. But before I, I say goodbye, um, perhaps to end on a on a message of hope, which is that uh, the year 2021, which is fast approaching, um, in our view, uh, presents uh, an opportunity for global policy development and for action on this uh, topic. We have governments who will be reporting against two targets of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction next year. We have uh, 2021 that will be the first global stock take of the Paris Agreement and the Task Force on Displacement under the UNFCCC, who will present their progress reports. We have the high-level political forum of the SDGs, which will review progress against some of the global goals that are of most direct relevance to internal displacement and to the well-being of, of IDPs. And we have, as Antonio mentioned several times, the high-level panel on internal displacement was, was set up uh, by the UN Secretary General earlier this year, and which will report on its work uh, in September at the 2021 General Assembly. So this is going to be an important year to take stock and to, to, to show progress on this topic. Uh, on our side at IDMC, 2021 will see the the publication of our next global report on internal displacement, our annual grid, uh, which will focus on displacement uh, in a changing climate, uh, which we hope can inform these processes and, uh, and these milestones. So certainly today's discussion has provided us with a lot of insights and a lot of extra uh, inputs, um, which I'm sure we're, my team will be uh, frantically compiling over the next few few weeks and perhaps even reaching back out to all of you bilaterally for, for more information. In the meantime, I would like to, to really warmly thank you for, for taking this time out uh, with us today for, for this deep dive into this topic. I hope it was uh, as interesting and as enriching to you as it has been for me. Um, we've had a very diverse set of perspectives, but that have all sort of converged uh, towards the same, the same points. So I thank you all very much uh, for your insights. Um, thank you all to, to, the, to the, the speakers, but also the audience and all the people who joined us today. I think we went up, I, I saw the number of participants that was close to 300. So clearly a lot of interest in this, uh, in this issue. Um, and thank you to my team for, for organizing all of this and for setting up the, the, the Zoom call. I think it's barring a few little things, it's, it's worked very well. So I hope next time it will be a meeting in person uh, and I, I wish you all a good health uh, and a good end of the, of the year and a happy festive season. Thank you. And, and thanks for taking the initiative and the organization. Thanks a lot, Alexandre. Thank you, Francois. Good to see you. Thank you, Rajib, Sonia, Antonio, and Francois. Have a Thank good you. rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.